Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another video. You read the title. Today, we are flash modding an iPod Mini. Now, this is actually something I had done not too long after I did my video talking about using the iPod Mini in 2020, but I had some issues with my MacBook where it had to go in for service, so I put the footage on my PC, and I lost the footage, then I got my Mac back, then I found the footage, then I realized I hadn't actually talked through the process, I had just recorded me doing it, so you'll see that cut in between here, but uh, all that aside, today we are talking about how to flash mod an iPod mini. Now, the first things first, why would you want to go and take an iPod mini apart to put a flash storage unit in it of, of any kind? You know, why would you want to do that? Well. There's a couple reasons, and I'm gonna start with the biggest one, which is that back in the day when these were being made, they used hard drives. Yeah, hard drives, like these big burly beauties. Yeah, this was basically something that they would miniaturize and put inside of this. And the hard drive they put inside of this is actually smaller than the hard drive that they would even put inside of the regular iPods that they were selling at the time. And it worked. That's how they got storage in the iPods from Gen 1 till the last iPod Classic that came out. There's one problem, though. Hard drives have moving components, and moving components tend to fail over time. It's getting worse. And Apple clearly knew this because there were only two generations and one design of the iPod mini before Apple went and replaced it with a 100% flash storage iPod Nano. And that trend pretty much held up through the later gen iPod Nanos and even the phones in your pocket from Samsung, Apple, Google, Huawei, whoever, are all running with flash storage because you can't go carrying around something on a daily basis with moving components. So that's the first reason why you would replace a hard drive with a flash storage unit in this. The second reason is battery life, because with moving components, there's motors. Those motors draw power, there's a needle that moves around, that draws power, and it goes into standby, but then anytime you have to access something new, it'll spin up again, and it's just this big process that really doesn't seem big, but will actually play into battery life. With a flash storage unit, there's no moving parts, which is a benefit for durability, like I had mentioned earlier, but also a benefit for battery life. Well, okay, fine. Um, let's just crack into the... There's no seams. There are no seams on this thing. How the hell do you get into one of these? Well, it seems daunting at first, but it's actually significantly easier than I thought, even after looking at the teardowns. And you actually gain access to this from the top and the bottom. These little white plastic caps are held on with adhesive. Editor's note, I'm throwing this in here because I forgot to mention it earlier, but before we even tear the iPod apart at all, you're gonna wanna put the lock button, the lock switch at the top, in the locked position. Now let's get into taking the iPod apart. So right out of the gate, you're gonna wanna take something that is either a fine edged piece of plastic, or if you're confident that you're not gonna scratch the metal, something metal, and begin to sort of wedge it between the plastic and the metal casing. You're gonna to wanna to pry up gently, not so hard that you're gonna break the plastic, but just enough that you can feel the adhesive start to give. Once it starts to give, keep peeling and working your way around the edges. Now you're gonna to wanna to be careful at the bottom because there is a ribbon cable underneath of a metal protective bar. So just be aware of that. All right, so now that you've removed the top and bottom plastic pieces, you're gonna flip it around to the bottom. Now I said that that ribbon cable was protected by a metal clip. You're gonna to wanna to remove that metal clip. Now it's held in place with sort of a press and bend sort of setup. So you're gonna to wanna to take a screwdriver or something small and pointed and bend that metal out of the way. Now, be very careful. It's not meant to be permanently bent. You're gonna to wanna to bend it just enough that you feel it pop loose. Once it's loose, the whole thing comes out. It's that simple. Now that you've removed that metal piece from the bottom of the iPod, you can now take a spudger or something soft plastic and pop that ribbon cable off from the board. That ribbon cable is actually the connector for your click wheel, so you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you don't damage that or it's gonna be a nightmare to try to navigate the iPod. And by nightmare, I mean impossible. All right, so now that we've disconnected the ribbon cable safely, hopefully, so that you can still use your iPod, we're gonna to go to the top and we're gonna remove a metal plate on the top of the iPod as well. Now, this metal plate covers the entire top and is held in place with two Phillips head screwdrivers. Yeah, Phillips head on an Apple product. I have not seen that in years, at least not 
in any easily accessible manner. So you're gonna to wanna to undo those two Phillips head screws. They are double zero, so if you have something like an iFixit kit, I'm not sponsored or anything, but if you have one of those, they're labeled, it's pretty easy to find. If not, uh, something like an eyeglasses repair kit might be uh, useful. That tends to be the screwdriver size you'll find in there. All right, so now that the hardest parts are out of the way, which honestly the hardest parts, at least for concern, would have been the plastic pieces, but now that all the hard parts are out of the way, we're to what I consider to be the easiest part of the disassembly, which is removing basically the entire iPod from its case, barring the click wheel. We'll get to that in a minute. You're literally just gonna take a thumb or two and press in from the bottom of the iPod while holding the case, and the entire board, battery, hard drive, screen, everything except the click wheel slides right out of the top. Yeah, so when I sat here and said there were no seams, that's because the entire iPod assembly is just pushed into the top of the iPod, and the click wheel is pushed in from the bottom of the iPod, and then they just screw and glue everything together. And honestly, it gives this really cool, like, seamless look that I really, I just love it. There is a daughter board that is really finicky to stay on, so if it does happen to pop out, don't worry about it. You can just press it right back into place. This happened several times while I was disassembling and reassembling the iPod, but as long as you sit it back in place the way it was, you're not gonna have to worry about it. It's the daughter board for the headphone jack, but fortunately it just fits right back into place. There's no screws, no pins, no ribbon cables. Just push it back in and you're good to go. All right, so now with the battery out of the way and hopefully the headphone jack daughter board still connected, we're gonna take the hard drive out, which is very easy to remove from the board anyway. You're literally gonna take a spudger and pop that ribbon cable right off the board. It's not soldered, it's literally just pressed into a socket, so just pop it out. Now we are gonna remove the other end of that ribbon cable from the hard drive, but first you'll notice that there are shock-mounted rubber pieces that in my instance felt like they had started to turn to jello and tape. So you're gonna to wanna to remove the tape and you're gonna to wanna to remove the shock mounts. And in my case, I didn't bother using the shock mounts again because it's solid state storage and it's not conductive on either side. So I don't care if it wobbles a little bit inside, as long as it's faster, I don't care. But if you wanna reuse it, just try to not damage it and put it back in its place. I didn't bother with that, but either way, take the tape off. Now with all the tape and shock mounting crap removed, you can pretty much just take a spudger and slightly press on either side upward very slowly and alternate sides as you do it until the connector on the other side of that ribbon cable detaches from the hard drive. Be very, very, very careful not to bend these pins. They are delicate. Also be careful not to begin to pry the actual ribbon cable away from those pins because once that happens, you're screwed. Now if you take a look at those pins, you'll notice that the layout is identical to a compact flash storage card, the same thing you'd use in a photo camera or a video camera. And well, they actually are identical. So this is where the fun part begins and this is where things just get easier and easier. If you've ever wanted to flash mod a regular iPod, something like one of these, you need to spend about 33 bucks on an iFlash adapter or some variation of that that goes inside of one of these and changes over the pin layout for an SD card or a compact flash card and makes it work with the proprietary ribbon cables and all that crap. But no, not on an iPod mini. It is literally a compact flash hard drive well, compact hard drive, to a compact flash drive. Just a compact flash card, plug and play, couldn't be any easier. In my instance, I chose a 64 gigabyte compact flash card because I really just want this thing for my collection and occasional usage if I'm going somewhere where I might not have signal and I wanna to listen to music. So there you go, I've got an iPod just in case. And 64 gigs is more than enough for that, plus compact flash is still kind of expensive, way more expensive than an SD card and I don't know why, but whatever, we're gonna use a 64 gig in my case, plug it right in, and now we're just gonna go in reverse. So now that we've got the compact flash card seated on the ribbon cable, we're gonna press the ribbon cable back onto the board, be sure to line it up before pressing. The last thing you wanna do is damage any of the plastic or silicon components on this board because if you screw anything up here, you've got yourself a little paperweight. Like I said, I didn't use any of the tape or the rubberized bits because I really don't care and I didn't wanna go through the trouble of trying to shock mount the thing again, so I just let it run naked inside the case. Once that battery's back in, you got everything lined up, make sure that it's as narrow and flat as you can possibly get it without applying too much pressure. Line it up with the top of that case that you took it out of a couple minutes ago and slide that thing right back in, making sure not to damage a small little piece on the board that is part of the controller system for the click wheel. If you mess that up, the click wheel freaks out and it's all over again. So just be careful of that. Speaking of click wheel, if this is the time that you wanna change out the click wheel, clean it, or just have it separate to take a look at, to remove the click wheel is actually really simple. You press in on the bottom part of the click wheel so that it goes beneath the metal shell, slide it out on the bottom side, 
and it comes right out. It's literally the same assembly type as the board, just thinner and higher up and it comes out of the bottom. So if you wanna change it out or if you have an issue with the click wheel, you can do that now. It's pretty cool. You can have the entire shell minus the plastic screen cover completely separate from the whole iPod and it's really cool to look at like it's this extruded metal. It's it's just cool from an engineering standpoint. It is so overbuilt. Anyway, back to the guts. So once you have the guts of the iPod slid back into its shell, you can go ahead and reconnect the ribbon cable for the click wheel and now you go and put the retaining clip back on the bottom of the iPod. Now, my method is not ideal if you're not experienced. I I'm a little more confident and a little more experienced than most, though that confidence can lead to overconfidence and damage. See my MacBook in 2008 to 2020 video for that. But anyway, my method might not work for everybody, but here's what I did. I basically took and bent the clip piece that lines up with the case back in a little bit until it fell into the case and then it clips back in. There's little cutouts for it to match up. You're gonna wanna be more careful than I was. I just figured I've got steady enough hands to do it. See, look steady as can be. Anyway, once you've got that back on, flip it over and you're gonna wanna line up the holes on the metal plate you removed with the lock button switch and the headphone jack. So once those are lined up, put the screws back in. Ideally, use a magnetized screwdriver because otherwise you might drop the screws back into the case and it's a nightmare. So just make sure that you have a nice set of screwdrivers that are magnetized so that the screws don't fall in. All right, cool, so now that those are all together, how do we get the plastic bits to stay on again. That's gonna be kind of weird, right? In my instance, it wasn't the adhesive that was there was still sticky enough to hold it in place. In fact, that's literally what I'm using right now and they hold just fine. They're not recessed or popped out or anything. They, they sit flush, they look happy. So in your case, it's just sort of a matter of whether you feel you need to or not. I didn't feel like I needed to. So I didn't. In the case that you do need to, I recommend using something like perhaps double-sided tape. I wouldn't use crazy glue just because if it drips and falls into the board, again, paperweight. But um, yeah, I would recommend like two-sided tape, cut it out, match it up, make sure that you can still use the hold switch and the headphone jack and, and the 30 pin. But if that's what you need to do, go for it. But otherwise, I just use the existing adhesive and it worked fine. All right, cool. So we now have a flash modded iPod. The whole thing's back together. Let's start loading music on here. Last and forever, saving that battery life. Hold your horses. We're not done yet. Don't worry, we are almost done, but there's one more step that you have to do, which is actually formatting it so that it knows what to do. Because if you fire this thing up, it's gonna immediately give you an error saying that it doesn't know what's on the drive, doesn't know how to read the drive. It doesn't say that, but the icon on there is what that means. But that is good. That means that you didn't break it. You just have an iPod now that doesn't know what to do with the drive you put into it. So congratulations, you put it back together. It's not dead. Now, here's how to make it actually work. Now, for those of you out there using PCs, I didn't restore this on a PC, I did restore it on a Mac, so I will leave a link in the description on how to restore an iPod from a Windows PC if you need to do that. I personally didn't, and I don't know how. I can probably figure it out, but I did it on a Mac, so for those Mac users here watching, this is how you do it. So first things first, you're gonna plug it in to your Mac. It's gonna show up like a hard drive, just regular old hard drive, and you're gonna to wanna to open Disk Utility, and in Disk Utility, it'll show up as Apple iPod Media, but it's gonna say something like no name or untitled or something like that. So you're gonna to wanna to select it and tell it to format it. Now, the default format settings work just fine, so just run it like that, you're good to go. Name it whatever you want, that's actually kind of a fun thing. Name it whatever you want, you're ready to go. Now, once that's done, you can open Finder on newer macOS versions and iTunes on older macOS versions, and you'll see that the iPod's showing up now, but it's saying it's in recovery mode. So you're gonna wanna tell it to restore the iPod. This is going to put the software on it. This is going to completely wipe the drive and make sure that it's exactly the way Apple and iTunes and Apple Music need it to put stuff on it. Once that's done, your iPod will boot up with a do not disconnect logo on the screen for the iPod itself and it's gonna show up as a regular old iPod, except it's gonna say whatever the amount of storage is that you put on it. In my case, 64 gigabytes. And that's it. Yeah, it's a bit of a long process. Yeah, this was a bit of a long video, but guess what? I now have, and if you're following along and actually doing this as I'm narrating the video, you now have a fully functional iPod mini with a flash storage drive inside. So you're gonna be saving battery life, you're gonna be saving a lot of time in loading, not as much as you'd think, because you're still going through 30 pin, but it is a bit faster. And you are saving this iPod from going in the landfill because the hard drive died. How freaking cool is that? Also, side note, those hard drives are so tiny. Look at this thing next to a compact flash card. They're literally about the same size 
I just love it, how small that drive is. I actually keep it on my desk as like a little ornament on top of my audio recorder. It's so cool. But yeah, you now have a fully flash modded iPod that is hopefully gonna last you quite a while. These things are such cool little collector's pieces. The teardown and repair process and replacement process is such a geeky little project, I love it. And just having one of these in your collection is so cool. And it's the easiest to mod because you literally don't need an adapter. You just plug in a compact flash card and well, that's what we did here, and now we have a fully functioning iPod mini, ready to go with 64 gigabytes of storage in my case. And that's it. This is the conclusion to my little two video iPod mini thing. If you wanna see the first one, right over there using an iPod mini in 2020. Otherwise, I am really happy to have this iPod mini with flash storage in it now. I'm super pumped to start using it again and just seeing how it works in modern day with flash storage. Maybe I'll do a follow-up video on that, but otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching. I love doing videos like this. You all make it possible with live stream donations, watching this video, the whole nine yards. So thank you guys for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe if you want more content like this. And otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for sitting through this tutorial. And uh, yeah, have a good one.